Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman, as usual, coming from the sort of rainy, mighty megalopolis of Kailua, Hawaii. It's not as pretty as the picture behind me. Um, we've had a lot of rain the last couple of days. Kind of typical, moving into the freezing winter of Hawaii, which will drop us down into maybe 65, 70 degrees here. You know, so we'll have to bust out the parkas. But anyway, thanks to everybody this morning at the Renew Revealed Hawaii Forum. I thought it came out really well. Uh, and we talked about microgrids and disasters, and I wanted to continue that theme today um, and talk about microgrids on my show. So my guest today um, is from the Northwestern US, and he's got quite an extensive resume in microgrids and control microgrid controls and, and things like that. So I wanted to keep the discussion going and today maybe get it more into a personal level or a uh, practical level of how you would what things you would consider building a microgrid, especially on a residential area, a residential you know structure, maybe a small business. So today's guest is uh, Gary Calderon, and he's uh, going to be joining us from, I guess, around Seattle, right? That's correct. Right. Oh, and then, and um, thanks, Gary. Thanks for joining us today, especially on fairly short notice. I just met um, Gary last week uh, via another gentleman, Bob. Um, who was interested in some of the things we're talking about on this program. So this timing worked out well, and I'm glad you could join us today. So could you start off by telling us a, a little bit, sharing with the viewers a little bit of your background? Um, your your resume is pretty extensive, so if I read it, we'd be out of time on the show. But right. uh, you can, can consolidate it a little bit and uh, give the folks some of your background. Uh, absolutely. So uh, background, um, electrical engineer out of UC Berkeley, computer science as well. Um, also MBA out of San Francisco, and more recently out of Lawrence uh, Berkeley Labs, uh, San Jose State, put a program, a master's of uh, uh, science and engineering for battery, battery technologies. As far as employment, um, I'll just talk about the last 10 years. Pre prior to that, it was more high tech with Sun Microsystems, IBM, Siemens Medical, and about 20 startups in Silicon Valley. But um, about, I say 10, 11 years ago, uh, started actually installing solar for um, a, a nonprofit that helped, let's say, a lot of the residential areas in the San Francisco Bay Area, the disadvantaged communities got solar installed for free. Uh, Grid Alternatives is the name of the nonprofit uh, headed up by two uh, Stanford grads, and it's going strong today. And then since then, um, that experience, I went to Solar City for a few years. Um, at the same time, I was working at the, the factory at Tesla over in Fremont, California. So the whole Bay Area, Bay Area was taken off on the solar side of things. Um, in, in addition to that, I started my own company that built microgrids and also had electric vehicle charging, not only for residential, but uh, and actually primarily like business parks and things like that. The focus on the microgrids was the fire stations and around emergency facilities. That's where we started, battery and canopy, you know, solar for parking lots. Uh, started working at Tessa um, at the actual factory selling both EV, EVs are the transportation electric vehicles as well as the solar and batteries for about eight years there. Uh, but <clears throat> had moved up to the Pacific Northwest, did Portland and did Seattle. And uh, more recently, I became a consultant for um, a lot of uh, projects, microgrid projects, um, as well as not just for resilience, but for what we call distributed energy resourcing, right? And where you have all these resources that come together under one umbrella, and you can actually manage all the electrons where the load is heavier. And so resilience, of course, is part of that but also load shifting and a few other things like that. Uh, what you can do in your home too, which I do with uh, my solar installation from Tesla. All right, thanks. Um, one of the takeaways I got from this morning's discussion with Renew Rebuild Hawaii was that um, locating microgrids in a region, the location is important for survival reasons and things like that. But one of the other reasons is, you know, you talked a little bit about um, um, distributed generation or being able to, to, you know, use the power from your solar right in your house and then maybe even share it. Um, right. And, and 
the thing that struck me was most of the utilities want to put the uh, microgrids near their near their generation um, and, and, and or run power to a microgrid from their generation. And really, when you get into the nuts and bolts, it's better to have the generation where your microgrid is. So using renewables and, and such. <clears throat> and of course, most power companies are set up with a centralized generation plant going out through high, high voltage wires to substations, from substations down to transformers and into buildings. Right. And, and so the real takeaway from, that I got from this morning from most of the microgrid people was, you're better off consolidating generation right where your microgrid is and using it, which makes sense. There's no line loss. Right. Um, you don't have, if you have hurricanes and things, you don't have those poles and stuff knocking wires down and having right. to recover from that. Right. So in, in that light, let's focus on your house and, and why don't you kind of walk us through your house a little bit. And then I'm gonna ask you some more specific questions about uh, decision points in designing your microgrids. Okay. Um, if you wanted to start with um, just the, uh, the pictures I provided, uh, we could do that too. but. At a high level, I do have batteries, not just for resiliency or backup. Uh, this is the installation here in my garage. So you're looking at two batteries there. That's close, just under uh, 30 kilowatt hours combined with that. And to the right, you see um, my Tesla EV charger. And then with considering this combination, there's still some answer. I mean, you still, need to tell the installers or whoever you're purchasing from whether or not you want just critical loads. It could be medical equipment only or your servers, uh, whatever, and maybe a few lights when there's an outage. I chose to do a whole home, right, which would take my whole entire service panel and back that up. And so I, so far, and it's going on two years right now, I've had about 20 outages, right? software that's provided with most of these installations allows you to sort of break out what you want as far as percentage wise maybe i'm on a 50 50 50 percent of my um, let's say excess solar stored in my batteries can be used for a potential outage the other 50 percent could be used for nighttime use once the sun goes down so i have control of that right the other thing that you mentioned is sharing electrons. So I also have that option with the utility. When the utility, for example, in this Seattle area, we had like 110, 115 degree um, uh, weather for about one week, right? Nobody was prepared for that. From coming from California, I have air conditioning and a lot of people don't, right? So they weren't used to that. So they would, they could, if they wanted to, is give me a call say, can you offer some kilowatt hours from your battery? That's called demand response. So that's another thing I signed up for to help my neighborhood in case there was uh, outages or just not enough generation, right? Um, so so is, that a, is that arrangement with the utility something that comes out of a public, util, public utilities um, docket and, and it's set up so that there's a formal agreement between the homeowner and the utility in terms of how you share things? Yes, Stan. So I wouldn't say every utility would do that, but uh, Puget Sound Energy, which is my utility, I used to have PG&E in the San Francisco Bay Area, but they do it too. So this is helping the community, right? So helping it become resilient, not just your home, but now can you really afford it? So you just got to look at the, the actual kilowatt hour store. Well, I might want to just keep it for my family because I have maybe medical equipment or some other things. So I may not sign up for that, but that's what res, uh, most residential today, not back in the day, but today more people are getting the battery solar combination for the reason of, for example, for the last six months, I haven't paid for one kilowatt hour in the Pacific Northwest with my system, which is actually uh, pointing Southeast. So in the summer, we have longer days too. But um, so I get a lot of solar in the Pacific Northwest. I uh -oh. took, took a lot of convincing when I was selling in Portland and <laughs> Seattle, and, but it works. So 
So how many how many kilowatts of solar panel do you have on your roof? So I have uh, just about eight kilowatts. Oh, okay, that's that's a pretty sizable amount. Here in Hawaii, just for your to comparison, right. when we're when we're estimating um, usage, we we estimate that we have about five and a half hours of rated power a day from our solar panels, just to because in the morning and afternoon it's not as good. Plus, sometimes you're you're got cloud cover or you're up near the mountains or you might have trees or you know near your house or whatever yes. and and so you know but when you when you do that calculation or when you did the calculation for your house you obviously had to take into account your tesla charger um i mean that you're charging your car that that takes quite a bit of power off of your your microgrid um, right and then and then you say your house is your whole house is um, powered by your your solar panels, where you you said that the electrician could basically take critical circuits or whatever circuits you want and divide them up. Yep. But how how did you just kind of walk us through your logic of how you calculated you needed eight kilowatts of power on your roof? Well, typically you're going to give them a year's worth of uh, your electricity bills, right? Right. Electricity bills pretty much dictate uh, how much how big of a system, and then you also you're looking at not only roof size, but you know some areas you have these fire setbacks. Your roof could be pretty big, but the fire setbacks could be three feet from, you know, from the, the edges of the roof to allow the fire department, in case of a fire, to walk around. So that takes a little bit of your real estate, sometimes a lot. So in my case, um, I was able to get those two arrays um, on my to come up to about eight kilowatt. So they indicated about 80% of an offset, meaning that 80% with the size system I, I chose, about 80% of my um, energy would come from the sun per year. So, and it depends. That's only counting if I, if I didn't use the batteries, right? If I only use the batteries for resiliency and they're just sitting there stored and not being used in the evening, then that would be 80%. But I, I think I'm pretty much net zero right now. So those are decisions. You may only want 50%. You may only want 25%. I have people, sometimes they don't want it, but they end up with it because of the shading conditions, especially in the Pacific Northwest and roof right orientation and size. So those are the components. Those are the things that the engineer looks at. So they look at trying to achieve your goals first. If you can get net zero, Right, a hundred percent of your, you know, your electricity coming from the sun annually, they'll go for it. But it's not always possible. But I'd say seventy to eighty percent is typical, and people are satisfied with that. So, do you re you recall what your average daily use was for that house before you switched over to solar? Um, I would say. Um, I, I do 30, have uh, 30 some something bills, kilowatt actually. hours, 30 something or 40 kilowatt it was, hours. It was just under because I had because um, I had daughters, right? So moved, they moved out. They like hair dryers and they like. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> that all adds so, up. Yeah. So they had left. So for college and stuff like that. But what I would say is probably maybe 15,000 uh, to 1,500 kilowatt hours, right? Um, a month. Okay. And then, of course, I have air conditioning, so that would go up uh, during the summer months, right? Um, so we looked at that. Um, I'm not too sure if we're prepared to show maybe uh, one of my bills or six. I think I had six of them prepared, but showing the difference of, and of course, we're looking at this geography, right? Um, not Hawaii, but looking at Pacific Northwest, where I'm pretty much in the last six months, I haven't paid a dime for his, uh, a kilowatt hour. So here it's illustrating on the left-hand side, it was the past year. And then since having solar on the far right, it's showing a lot less. And as you go down in the bills, you'll start seeing that it's close to nothing. Now, this year is even, even less, right? That's after the first year. So it does work. I mean, and yeah. A lot of cases, you have a lot more sun than, than we do right now. It's like raining every day for the last four weeks. And, but it's constant rain. It's a real winter and sometimes snow, right? So yep. 
Well, you were going through your bills there. I busted out my calculator. It looks like you're you're averaging between 45 and 50 kilowatt hours a day uh, average for your your mm -hmm. um, usage with your daughters and their hair dryers and stuff. <laughs> so you're probably down around 40 with yeah. eight kilowatts of solar on your roof. Um, you're you're about like my next door neighbor who has almost your identical system. He has two Tesla power walls. Okay. And he has around, I think, 30, between 35 um, and 40, um, basically kilowatt hours of production available every day. Yeah. So that's probably around seven or eight kilowatts of PV panels um, based on our, our solar. So uh, from, from my perspective, what you generally do is, like you say, you start off with your electric bill. You, you estimate your usage. You kind of anticipate future use, like you're going to get an electric vehicle or, you know, sure. you know maybe you're, you're doing more work from home or something. So you kind of throw that in. Right. Um, and maybe even you minus some off for LED lighting and, you know, things that don't take as much power and try and get as good an estimate as you can. Um, I generally recommend that you kind of overproduce solar just a little bit, especially with store. And I don't I don't recommend anybody get solar without storage. For me, if you don't get storage, it's really you're you're just selling yourself short. And you want to talk about that from a homeowner's perspective? Yeah, so a lot of people think they will still have backup, right? Or resiliency just by having just solar, right? Solar panels, uh, solar arrays, and it's, okay, I have backup. I've talked to many, many people, and they, oh, I've had solar for a long time. I don't need a battery. I have backup. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't have backup. And in fact, when there's the lines are down or somebody's on the lines troubleshooting, the inverter is disconnecting, right? You're sort of islanded from the grid until that's fixed and then they reconnect you. Uh, so that's one thing you have to make clear to people that you don't have backup with the batteries. You, you will be able to use the batteries. You're still disconnected from the grid when there's an outage, right? So you don't electrocute somebody that's troubleshooting on the lines and your solar is working for you as long as the sun's out, right? But your batteries, the power source or the energy source right now. So generating that solar during the day, it will still continue to charge your batteries. So that's like a virtual power plant, if you will. That's what I call it. You have your virtual, and you don't have to, it's, it depends on the software too. Uh, you can't physically island, right? Once you're connected to a utility, at least in these parts, um, I know in California, Oregon, and, and Washington on the West Coast here. Um, I don't know what Hawaii allows you to do if you decide to go off grid, but that's the case here. So it, it's hard to to disconnect from the grid. Um, connected. Yeah, especially once you connect to the grid. Right. Um, so so let's kind of walk through the system, and this is really basic stuff for you. But you have the solar on your roof. You calculated how much you need. It's up there. It produces DC electric power that comes into a controller that charges your battery and 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 sends power either to your inverters or to your battery depending if you're charging your battery or running your other system right so if once your batteries are charged it cuts off from the batteries and and it's going just to the uh to your your inverters your inverters then um change the dc electricity to ac power right so it can run your all your household appliances and things like that. Um, and those control items are important too. And depending on whether you're, like you say, if you're off grid, you probably have choices of voltage, whether you wanna stick with a real basic 12 volt or 36 or 48 volt. But those Tesla walls, what do they basically run at voltage wise? Are they 48 volt? Oh, they, it's a DC coupled, right? It's not AC coupled like uh, okay All one right. thing is that the micro uh, the microgrid inverters that are in the back those instead of your central inverter that uh some people you know it depends on a lot of people think it's um advantageous to have a, a micro inverter behind every panel right okay that's ac coming off that Ooh, off that wow. array okay so now you need an ac coupled type uh, power wall or inverter, right? I should okay. say. And so, uh, with the central, I have the, the centralized type of inverter. Is DC coming off the roof 
it's converted to AC. And now that's charging um, my inverter internal of the power wall, right? And so there's really, everything's regulated. So it's not, you, you don't really have to look at uh, voltage 12, 24, okay. 48. That's already built in, right? And it doesn't have to be Tesla inverters. I mean, mm -hmm. the inverters that are used right now, I mean, um, there's a variety of them that work very well, you know, DC. That and a lot of it's um, solid state, right? So it's not like the old versions that were 150 pounds to install, which I was that was very hard to do by yourself. But today, there's a lot. That's a data logger as well. So that's collecting that information. Another point here I want to make is that information in the in the solar inverter is collecting data continuously, allowing you to view real time on your phone, what's going on. But also in the case of uh, Sunrun, Tesla, and a lot of other, um, let's say solar uh, providers or solar PV installers, they'll provide you with software to allow you to you view it, uh, let's say real time, 24 hours a day, and for them to also be able to troubleshoot and view it too. Because they sign a contract with you, right? In most cases, it's a power purchase agreement could be a lease and could be just an all out purchase. So they have uh, regarding the contract, cause I know I'm looking at the time to make sure we have enough time because this is important too. Um, they're promising so many kilowatt hours for 20 years, for example, if it's a 20 year contract uh, or warranty, I should say. And there's degradation that happens over the years because of the sun, right? This beating down on it. Uh, some more than other environments, right? So they have this whole uh, table of what they're promising as far as generation and degradation on those panels and the other hardware. Um, so it's important to note that, to understand that, because some people don't look at contracts that closely or don't understand them and don't ask questions. So it's very, very important to look at those tables and see, oh, 10 years from now, if I'm getting it's a half a percent degradation on my panels, wow, that's going to go down five percent, right? or wow, in twenty years it's going to be that. And by that time, who knows? They may not be living there, but they need to know the next. Let the next homeowner understand that contract, and especially if it's a power purchase agreement. It has to be transferred over to the new homeowner, right? If, so, if it belongs to the house or installs belongs to the homeowner, the current homeowner that's part of it, just like the kitchen sink is part of the sale, right? Yeah, a lot of people like to opt for the power purchase agreement for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's usually uh, much more affordable because it's more like just paying the utility company, you're yeah. paying the power purchase company. They, they, still, they own the equipment on your house yes. um, yeah. and you're just paying a monthly bill for electricity. Exactly, um, and they're doing all the maintenance, everything. Yeah. Right. Now, let's say after, an, in the case of my, my purchase, uh, power purse, uh, PPAs, I should say, power purchase agreements, um, when I was with Solar City, after about five years, you were able to purchase, you had the option to purchase and own that system. So um, it, that's something need, that needs to be reviewed at some time, uh, because a lot of times it might take uh, 30 to 60 days, maybe longer to install these. And People just anxious to get it and they'll start signing things and, and everything's online and they won't pay attention to the warranty, which is very important. So uh, that's that's a heads up for anybody listening. Well, speaking of warranties, you know, one of my observations is there's there are a lot of people who are really afraid to not be grid tied, you know, like they, they would never go off grid because it terrifies them to think they're responsible for their own electricity. Yeah. But the equipment is actually pretty reliable. And as long as you understand the degradation of the solar and the batteries, batteries right. degrade over time as well. Right. Um, how much, you know, in terms of daily maintenance or monthly maintenance or annual maintenance, really, is there that much to do with your system? The only thing I could think of, especially in parts where you have a lot of trees, like Pacific Northwest, uh, sometimes they have moss, sometimes they have uh, branches or you know, just needles piling up and things like that. And they do get a little dusty. 
I mean, I would never suggest somebody get on the roof and start spraying them down, but maybe hire somebody. But it's 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 a little dangerous just to be on the roof, not with solar, but <laughs> with or without solar. Yeah. So I quite often ask, do you have, you know, sort of a dusty area, dusty roads or trees hanging over on parts of your, your roof because the dust is going to cover that? They'll be more efficient if they're just, just spraying them off. You don't have to scrub them. So uh, as far as the other maintenance on, on the hardware you saw in my garage, that picture, that you don't need to touch anything. If something goes wrong, let's say I'm up with my batteries, within those two enclosures, there is on the top half, the inverter, right? If you were to open that up in the bottom, then you have your batteries, right? Your battery cells. And remotely, they can actually test things. So in the case of Tesla, and I believe with others and the competitors, they're doing upgrades remotely like they do with their electric vehicles, right? You're not saying yes or no to an upgrade. They're continuously upgrading them remotely uh, through the Wi-Fi of your home, right? So uh, I would say in almost all cases, you're going to need some type of uh, internet connection, Wi-Fi. They'll give you a router so they can monitor what's going on. And they've contacted me too saying, hey, something's wrong with your router. Hey, something and via uh, my cell phone, right? They'll text me and something. And so they're on top of it. They have these alarms going off with all their installations. So it's come a long way. Uh, as far as pricing, uh, it looks like we have three minutes here. Uh, as far as pricing of uh, solar panels, I've been doing it for over 10 years, right? Um, and I believe when I first started, uh, per, per watt to install, it was closer to like eight, nine dollars per watt. So the prices have come down considerably. And closer to a buck fifty, right? Per watt for installation of solar. The other thing is, administration today has uh, continued the 26% federal tax credit, not just for the solar, but for both solar and battery. And if you decide to get a battery at a later date, uh, within the next two years, you'll also, uh, as a retrofit, get your 26% federal tax credit once that battery is installed. So it's a pretty good opportunity to, to go after solar if, um, if it's something that you've been looking at and waiting for prices to go down. Well, that's, uh, that's a pretty good place to wrap things up here because uh, believe it or not, we, we have hit our, our time limit. But um, I, I'd like to say just for a, another uh, piece of confidence builder, if you're thinking of getting solar, do a good job, work with a good company, consider a power purchase agreement, if for, especially if you're, little nervous about maintaining some of your own gear and by all means get battery backup good advice great advice <laughs> okay well okay. gary thanks so much for joining us today oh, and thank um you, you know we'll, we'll talk to bob and maybe have both you guys back on, on another show and talk a little bit more about um microgrids in more detail Absolutely. so thanks for being here and um until next tuesday to all the viewers Dan Energy Man signing off. Aloha.